Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. This is episode number 101, and today I want to just kind of have a conversation really about 1 John chapter 4. We start in verse 7, may or may not get through verse 21. I have nothing prepared. This is really just kind of a conversation out loud, sharing some thoughts, maybe parts that I, I myself may grapple with or the way I understand what I'm reading. So this may be an episode of more questions than answers. Um, I have to be okay with that uh, because that's part of, I think, discovery and the, the excitement that is available inside of God's Word is it generates this pursuit of understanding and we may we may not have the answers in the moment as we come to it but the the part of exploration is trekking through those places of unknown territories and the discovery before any maps are made one has to first explore territory and once a familiarity occurs then a person, an individual, can can plot out this e- exploration, if you will. And I think it's it, this is the same thing in which, at least I personally do, uh, regularly in my own Bible time. So uh, we'll just kind of read and maybe interject some thoughts or some questions and just see what happens. So thanks for taking the time to stop in. I hope this is a blessing. So we are in 1 John chapter 4. Uh, Tonight I'm reading out of the NIV, and we'll uh, go from there. Verse 7 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. So John establishes there that love comes from God meaning God is the source of love. He is the one who enables our ability to love. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Well, this is a hard verse for me to reconcile, maybe is a word, because I know people, and I'm sure you do as well, who how I understand love, and this is probably a limitation in this verse to me, is my understanding of love. Um, But we all probably know someone who loves, yet they are not, they, they are not, they don't know God, nor are they, could we use the phrase born again in, uh, synonymously with born of God. Um, we, we all are, in, in the sense, of born of God because God is the source of life. God is creator. Uh, we're not born of accident or born of, of evil. We, we may be born into evil, but we're not born of evil in the sense that it creates us. We are born of God. God is the source of all life. So... There's a lot maybe going on in that one line, but it is one that I would that I struggle with to reconcile in my own understanding. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. And so without getting mired down too far there, we'll just keep going. Verse 8 says, Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. So John is here... Uh, kind of equilibrating or putting on a, you know, an equal God is love. If you don't love, then you don't know God. They are, it's, they are synonymous. God is love. If you know God, then you know love. If you have love, then you know God. It's, it's a deeper thing, I believe, to say that God is love rather than to say God has love or 
demonstrates love. One communicates, well, God is love, communicates that it's something that he is, it's substance. But but to say that God has love, as in to offer, or God possesses love, or extends love, this is kind of a a subset of God. So it's a greater thing to be able to declare that God is love. It is his substance. It is who he is. So that's a powerful thing to consider, just those three words, God is love. Verse 9, this is how God showed his love among us. So he's about to tell us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Now, that's a very powerful, I, would, I could say maybe summary of great news that we have. Great news that is available. Um, this is how God showed his love. And he did it by sending his one and only. That's a phrase that we see quite often and come across, one and only. It, at first glance, it may seem or feel like a redundant thing to say. Doesn't one imply only and doesn't only imply one? But we see this actually many times throughout the Bible it's this extension. I think maybe there's also just a there's a, a, a an art to it in the Jewish uh, writing style, especially in the Old Testament, where it gives you a thought and then expands it. It may be even called expansion, if I recall. But it's we see that type of. Uh, flow quite often throughout biblical scripture. Um, but it's, don't think of it as redundant. Think of it as a, an expansive, immersive um, d- description. It's not the right word, but experience. It's his one and only. So, He, God, sent his one and only son into the world. So there's this incarnation that happens where his son, Jesus, enters into the world. We know that he's incarnated as a man, born as a child, becomes man as in humankind, into the world, that we might, or so we may live through him. So that identifies through him, Jesus being the only way unto life. So such a, such a small uh, sentence that encapsulates uh, so much of the gospel and just communicates um, critical information to us. And not just in the sense of information, here's some information for you to uh, absorb, but it's really the, the, the substance of life itself. Uh, through Jesus, we can obtain life through him. Verse 10 says, this is love. So he's, now John is, is helping us to define this is this is love. He's defining some love, what love is for us. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. It's written elsewhere that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So even when we were enemies of God, Jesus died to give us the opportunity to come to him obtaining life. And it's it's powerful to think of if you, it's written elsewhere that 
um, people would more willingly die for for someone who they care for or who they have an investment in relationally, someone that they love, but but would they die for someone who is an enemy of them? I mean, we were, before coming to Christ, we were at enmity, we were at odds with, we were enemies of God until we came um until we came into Christ and this verse tells us that it's not that we loved God it, it, we didn't initiate it but that he loved us and as as that love in that love he sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins he bridged the gap to make it possible for us to be restored back to God. Verse 11, dear friends, since God so loved us, that sounds very familiar with John uh, 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whomever would believe in him shall inherit eternal life. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Now, this is a verse just on its own that could be pondered on for quite some time. It says, for God so loved us, we ought to love one another. How is that important? Because God, we think about the individual level. God loved you so much. God loved me. God loved your neighbor so much, your friends, your children. He loved them, you, so much that he sent his only son. So, if God saw such intrinsic value and 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 you know, sometimes we get caught up in this in this thinking that that we are we are nothing and we are scum and detestable and 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 I understand the the perspective of that. It's this humility thing, but but we must be careful with that kind of thinking because we're we're actually we're desirable. How do I know that we're desirable? Because God chose to send the the most priceless um the most priceless one to redeem us back to himself any anything is valuable based on the price that someone is willing to pay for it how much more of infinite value is jesus the eternal god of how much value is he and Answering that, that it must mean he's of infinite value. And if that's true, then how much are we each worth to God? We're infinitely valuable to him. So we've got to be careful with this, with this, some of this thinking that we are worthless scum and it, it, it it's kind of murky ground, um, I believe it runs counter to the heart of God. And so if God sees such value, such intrinsic value, such desire for these each individuals, then we have to, we have an obligation. John uses the word we ought to. We're obligated to love one another. How can I look uh, down upon or detest something or someone that God sees and has a passionate desire for. That that must mean, if if I did that, that must mean that I'm disconnected from his heart. Even people who don't look like us, think like us, act like us, behave like us, I would even argue that even those who have yet to be redeemed 
to him. God still loves it. I mean, John t- told us this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. So God initiated this love and sent his son before we even could reach out our hand to lay hold of it. That's that's powerful. Powerful. And and so it's not my redeemed status that that, that causes God to love me. He loves us because how did John define it? God is love. He is love. He can't help himself. It's just who he is. And and we think you may think or ask the question, you know, how does that reconcile with this Old Testament idea of God? Well, every time you flip the page, you're you're reading about you know God putting to death these people or sending enemies in to capture this man, put to death these people, and and all this thing. You see all this judgment. And you see all this death. Well, if you take just a moment to think about the judgment of God is actually rooted in love. Because how loving would it be for a all all powerful almighty God to allow behavior that is that runs counter to his heart, that runs opposite or against his heart, his desire, his wishes, his commandments. How how uh, how opposite would that be? So it's actually the love of God that would bring about that would bring about the judgment. It's 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 even the love of God that would that would cause judgment to come to pass. You know, I was thinking about this topic and flipping to it here, but I had this illustration in in my in my mind one day recently, and I called this the road of God. And this pertains to this judgment and the love of God. Um, Most of us that are listening will have roads where we drive our vehicles. So think of a, um, of a, of a typical, um, you know, highly traveled road. And on this road, you have, you know, you have, Two lanes, traffic, you know, cars are traveling in these lanes. And each lane has its has its markings. It has the middle line that divides so that cars don't drift into each other's lane. So you have your lane that you stay in in your vehicle. And then just to the outside of that edge, you have these little, um, they're like cuts or divots in the road. Because then that way when you start to drift off the road, it makes this thumping noise. And it's meant to snap you out of this. You maybe have fell asleep or something along those lines. And that noise causes you to snap out of it. And it's very alarming, very even fearful. But if you go past that, then you have guardrails. And... The guardrails are meant to, if your car drifts even further and you hit these guardrails, they keep you out of a a more treacherous position. This may be other oncoming traffic or could be a ditch, uh, you know, a deep deep ravine that you would be highly injured in. So when we picture this road, think of the lane that you're driving your car in as you keep it in the boundaries of your lane, between the lines that you're traveling, think of that place as the love and good pleasure of God. Now, we just read this here in John, and he tells us that not that we loved God, but that he loved us. So even while we were outside of the will of God, God loved us. So when I say the love of God, I'm not meaning that it. I'm only loved by God when I'm staying in my the the lane of his good pleasure that's that's not what i'm um, insinuating but um god loves it god's heart is filled with love when we under his leadership stay within 
the bounds of his good pleasure, within the bounds of, of his, the heart of God, the desire of God, and the commandments of God. You know, just because we're in a new covenantal period doesn't mean that there's not commandments. There's not the the commandments of the Mosaic law, but there are commandments still that we must uphold. You know, it's not a free for all. We can't we can't behave however we want. There's still commandments that we follow, just not tied to the Mosaic law and not tied to how we are justified before God. Definitely not that. No, we're justified by grace through the mercy of God by Christ alone. But so back to this picturing this road, think of your lane as the love and good pleasure of God. This is where I am traveling, I am moving in in the path that he has laid out for me, and I am being obedient, and I am moving according to the motions of the Spirit. Now, think about then just outside of the line where you hit those, um, those divots and making that thumping noise. Okay, once, once you hit that, you are awakened by this rush of, we'll call it fear. And I call this, I call that place the fear of the Lord. It's the fear of the Lord um, that is meant to snap us back into the lane, if you will, of the love and good pleasure of God. Now, I was hearing a, a, a preacher who was sharing on this idea of the fear of the Lord. And, and it really has recaptured for me personally uh, some of what I have lost in understanding the fear of the Lord. I used, I have been thinking, you know, fear of the Lord as in the this reverence that you have for God. And while reverence is, is captivated within that, I think I'm starting to see that the fear of the Lord is also fear. <laughs> Think about in the in the Old Testament time where God is uh, abiding at Mount Sinai, and He is He is a a cloud of of smoke and and thunders and peals, and the people are terrified. They are terrified. They actually tell Moses. Tell, we we have to talk and deal with you. We cannot interact with God uh, or we will die. <laughs> they are terrified. Think of, think of uh, Elijah. Um, it's, sorry, it's not Elijah. Um, Ezekiel with, I'm a man of unclean lips. Or Isaiah, um, he has this fear of, you know, this is a holy God and who am I? I am unclean and I am not worthy. John in Revelation um, doesn't he fall fall down as though he's dead um, until he is strengthened by uh, the one who would give him this message. Many many instances where there is a fear, not just a reverential component, but a true fear, a terrifying magnitude of who God is. And I am starting to 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 now appreciate that aspect. It doesn't mean it's a bad thing. When you think about a parent, let's say you have, you know, a good father. And as a good father, you can experience him in a way that you can crawl into his lap and and sit with him and he can love you and be tender. But there's also a side of your of a good father, who is the uh, disciplinarian, who you will not just behave however you want because you have a fear of him, because he can bring about, uh, he can judge your behavior, and there will be consequences for it. So there is a fear, so you can contain both tenderness and fear of. And I believe that's something that I'm I'm appreciating now that I hadn't before. So when I say the fear of the Lord, I believe it's a, a great illustration for when we hit those little bumpers in the road, those divots, and they jolt you with that fear, it is to awaken or quicken you back into the 
lane of his love and good pleasure. Further outside of the lane, you would run into the guardrail. And I will call that the judgment of God. Now, I tie this to my previous statement that even the judgment of God is rooted in love. And, and I think this picture illustrates that because when you hit the guardrail, what is it meant to do? It's meant to keep you from being, being slung to a place that you can't get back out of or perhaps even more furiously injured. It's meant to drive you back into the safety of the lane. And of course, there is there could be injury, there can be damage that's occurred to your vehicle as you hit the guardrail, no doubt. But it's rooted in love because it wants to bring you back to the place of his love and good pleasure. So I call this the, the road of God, and I think it illustrates very important components to things that are very difficult sometimes for us to lay hold of, myself included, but it's the love and good pleasure of God moving in in the lane of his desire, the fear of the Lord that is meant to awaken or quicken you back to that good pleasure, and then further out the judgment of God that's meant to, again, bring you back into the lane of his good pleasure. Um. So we'll close out this with just a, a verse or more or two. Uh, this is love, John says, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Notice multiple, many sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. We, we are obligated to love one another. We are obligated to value the one that God so greatly loves and desires. Verse 12, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is the last thought I want to share. Um, it, it ties to a, a conversation that I had with a friend from church, and, and I think it's an important one. Um, so this translation says made complete. His love is made complete in us. Uh, I believe the English Standard Version uses says his love is uh, perfected in us. This is an important idea because... We, we see we see elsewhere um, it, I think it's maybe further on down uh, in verse 18 but he talks about um, there is no fear in love perfect lot love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment the one who fears is not made perfect in love When we, when we live our lives in our, in our day-to-day -day, um, experiential part of life, our love grows, it matures, it changes. And just like in our natural life, we are young and then we grow older. The, the idea naturally is that we would go from an immature state to a mature state. Our love does something similar. It goes from an immature to a matured state. And on the journey to the matured love is this, is this place of being perfected. And as I will take an example with, with my wife, I can love her. And years from now, my love can be on this pathway of being perfected, I can love her better, more, more wholly, more fully, more completely. And it is, it's this idea of being perfected. And 
we read we read eventually that the one who fears when fear is in the equation there is that is an indication that our love has not reached perfection it has not been fully perfected so as we go day in day on our journey of life with Christ in Christ we can um, we can strive for being perfected every day in reaching out to Christ to do the work that we are ourselves unable to do, but but crave it and desire it by the Holy Spirit. And if we will faithfully obey what the Lord teaches and deals with us in, then we can yield ourselves to the potter and we the clay can be more more holy and completely molded and shaped on his will and be perfected in love. So I think this is where we will end today. Um, I pray this was a blessing. Uh, It's always a joy to get on here and share uh, my heart, and I pray that God's heart is manifested through it. Uh, Thank you for taking the time to join me, and we will see you on the next one. God bless. I'm close to you. I would trade a million lifetimes for a moment here with you.